Hey, what's up, guys? Today, I sat down with Stephen Michael Horowitz, who is an audio director at Nickelodeon, composer, and professor of music for film and games at San Francisco State University, along with two of his grad students named Kevin and Nathaniel. And it was such a cool conversation. You know, I grew up playing a lot of video games and hearing their perspective being game audio designers and game and film scorers was super fun and insightful. And I'm sure a lot of you guys that find a lot of those topics interesting would feel the same way. And it was also really fun managing that sort of multi-guest dynamic. This is actually the first episode where there was three guests in addition to myself in conversation. And it was a really cool experience sort of managing that conversation dynamic, which comes with having multiple guests on the mic. So yeah, if there's any feedback you guys like to share in regards to the episodes, especially in regards to managing that sort of multi-guest dynamic, I'd love to see what you guys have to say. And without further ado, here's Atlas019, Stephen Michael Horowitz, along with Kevin and Nathaniel. Give I some more of your meditation For it gives my inspiration Steven, Nathaniel, Kevin, thanks so much for, for being with me today. I'm excited about today's episode. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. First yeah. question I had, and whoever would like to tackle it can go, um, how did you guys first become interested in game audio? Cool. Yeah, I I'd love to hear these guys first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll definitely jump in. Yeah, sure. Uh, I would say I started getting in game audio when I first kind of heard about the program at SF State, and how there was actually educational resources for game audio, because before that, I'd gone through undergrad in music, and... I'd never heard of like game programs. I mean, that was back in like 2012, right? And nowadays you see other game programs popping up. So that's really what I heard about it and started really getting into it. Uh, yeah, and then from there, just going through the program, I started to learn more about the different tools and other stuff other than just you create sounds, you create music. There's also all this other stuff that you can do that really got me deeper into game audio. Cool. Uh, very similar to Kevin. When I entered the program, uh, I got introduced to the idea. I, I always knew that there was sound in games and music in games. It seems apparent, but didn't really think about, you know, how people composing for it. I was more uh, thinking about, you know, film scoring and that sort of thing. And, mm -hmm. and that brought me into the program. But when I found out about game audio, it was definitely something that interested me and, and something I wanted to find out more about. Mm. Yeah, uh, similar for me, except it started in 1991 <laughs> or 19, yeah, right about. So I had uh, come out of studying at CalArts and just thought I would write weird music and die poor. And a friend of mine, my cousin came into town and a good friend of his was running a company called uh, Neuromantic Productions. Uh, and they were basically doing music and sound design for Sony, Sega, Crystal Dynamics, because at that time in the Bay Area, that was... Sillywood, right? That's merger of Silicon Valley and Hollywood. And he's like, did you ever think about making your living writing music for games? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and that's, that's where it started, really, is uh, I followed Mark around, Mark Miller, who's the recipient of the first Game Audio Network Guild Award, uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, I followed him around, um, and he basically gave me my introduction to all these companies and all this cool technology. And I found out that I really liked all the arcane uh, technology and all the different systems. And I, I just found it fascinating and super, super cool. Great. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm really curious to learn more about as far as game audio goes is I hear sometimes painters talk about how the music they listen to inspires what they paint. And then a lot of times I hear musicians talk about how paintings inspire what they paint, uh, what they create, right? And I'm curious from a game audio perspective, if there's maybe a historical precedent for people designing games based on game audio that was created before the game even uh, was incepted, or if most of the time it's pretty commonplace in the industry for the game audio to come after the design of the game. So for commercial products, like most of the time, it's it's the way that you're thinking about it. It's like, you know, I'll get images or composers will get images from games or complete full, complete games. Remember, you know, we're scoring, right? So it's either for animated worlds or sometimes for realistic live action cutscenes and things like that uh, in games. And you're inspired by those. And then you 
you start writing music for it. But to your point, I mean, there are situations now where you get game dev teams where the music can come first, just like in, in, in film, right? Um, and just from a few images, I, the, the person that I think about is a composer named Austin Wintery, right? Mm -hmm. Who became, you know, well known um, for a game called uh, Journey. And um, he worked with a company called That Game Company, right? And That Game Company made a, you know, they made Journey. Before that, they made a game called Flower. There was a game called Flow before that. And he had worked on all of those. And he gets in super early, right? And iterated on the music. And they, you know, changed the game to some of the visuals, you know, to, to match the music. Um, and they did that for you know, two years before they released that game. Mm. And he was there, you know, in the beginning. So, you know, uh, much like in film, right? Um, you know, composers like Bernard Herrmann, uh, Jerry Goldsmith, right? They will get in early. They'll see those first cuts of the films. And they'll, they'll already be composing, right? Um, or someone like Ennio Morricone, like that famous scene in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, right? Where it's the shootout scene at the end and everything's cut and it's giant faces and everybody, you know, it's all face acting, you know, and they're about, I don't know if you know this movie. You should no. see it if you don't know oh. it. Um, Nate's going, oh, you should see it. But it's, you it's watch. all the music was written and Sergio Leone cut to that music. Mm -hmm. So more and more that's happening in games. It goes back and forth. It depends on who the, the game designers are and the directors and, and how that works. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a two way street. And, and I know that I'm a, incredibly influenced by visuals mm. so i have even a couple of my own albums that are like one of my favorite painters is east town guy a surrealist painter and i have a, a chamber piece that's just based on a a painting of his yeah and i'd love if you could speak to maybe your creative process of how visual elements sort of inspire the sounds that you create and then maybe if nate and uh, kevin afterwards can pitch in and i'd love if you may you maybe play something to walk us through Shh. what inspired you to create the sound the way you did Sure. Um, why don't you guys, I'll pull something up um, that I can play, and why don't you guys maybe answer that question, yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring something I'll up that we can listen to. Oh, you're throwing it to me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, answering uh, how we are inspired by what we're seeing? Yeah, how you're inspired by visual elements. I mean, there's definitely, whenever you're, whenever you're looking at some kind of visual and you're trying to figure out what fits with it, there's things that are going to trigger thoughts, whether it's <laughs> colors of how things are looking. You know, if, if we're looking at something that's very, very dark versus some bright cartoon, you know, those would have very different, probably musical care, or, you know, things that would be going with them. So a lot of it would be uh, based on, on colors. Uh, is it cartoony or is it realistic looking? Is it, what's the motion? action like is it something that's slow moving or is it very fast paced and running around so a lot of those i mean they seem like fairly broad things but color uh realism motion all of those would definitely be elements that would push me towards one type of sound or another or one type of music versus another yeah yeah and when i think about and imagine what it must be like to have to create a creative process in order to make sounds that fit visual elements. It seems like an understanding of music theory would be really important. And a lot of times I've seen artists, and we all know great artists that sort of learn music more instinctively. They don't know much about music theory, but mm -hmm. they're able to create these beautiful songs just off of their own lived experience playing the instrument and not based on some study of theory. As far as game audio goes, is there a president of maybe great game audio composers that came from backgrounds that didn't include much of studying of music theory? Or is studying music theory something that's really important specifically for creating game audio? Um, it's a little bit of both. So, I mean, there are composers, great composers, who, just like you said, they're just instinctual. Maybe they came out of rock or pop or EDM, and they're finding themselves writing music for games. And that's just fine. And then there are other composers that, you know, are very well studied, of course, deeply, you know, in, in entrenched in music theory and, you know, bringing out emotion on the screen in different ways. So it's, it's, really, it's really a mixed bag. I mean, um, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of times when people think about games these days, you know, uh, the old way of thinking about it was just AAA titles, right? All these, all these console games. Mm -hmm. But now there are so many cool games that are being made 
um, and that are coming out and that um, musicians and sound designers are working on that are indie titles, right? I'm thinking about Bit Trip Runner. I'm thinking about Celeste. I'm thinking about Lena Rain as a composer. And again, composers like Austin Winery and, and, and Guy Whitmore. And they're working on smaller really super interesting projects. Some of them start out small and then go to console or go to bigger, you know, uh, distribution mediums. But um, yeah, uh, it's really all over the map. I wouldn't say that you have to have um, a degree, you know, in music theory to score games or to score films for that matter. And I think that part of that also is the technology, right? what we're hearing in films, what we're seeing in games, what we're hearing in games, uh, you know, is, is being, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's easier. You guys can chime in on this mm -hmm. too. I just think that there's a lot of technology that's available so that more people could compose, right? I mean, back in the day, if, you, if you're in 1950, San Francisco, there are 500 registered composers in the United States who would call themselves composers. Wow. What do you think it is now? It's probably like 50,000, 100,000 people who are involved in different media or register, you know, that think of themselves as composers. And that has to do with the technology making things more readily available. And then I'll throw this out to you guys. It's like, what's AI going to do that? <laughs> right? Do I, need, you know, do I need to know music theory if I could just put in, okay, AI, chat, music, bot, G, P, M, M for music. Um, go ahead and write me a song with, uh, you know, that is in E minor and then whatever. You know, you put it in and then it, it, sure. it composes something, you know, really nice that you can put together, throw into your DAW, reorchestrate or something like that. Yeah, and like, just to pick your guys' brains, yeah. uh, I really want to get a good understanding of where your brain goes when you start looking at a visual element of a game. Mm. If you see sort of like a really happy, bright uh, landscape, does yeah. that sort of instinctively mean like, okay, this is going to be a major scale song and then dark minor scale? <laughs> Or is it a little bit more varying and different than what I'm going to let you guys answer this again, because we talk about this in class when we talk in our scoring classes about about this type of looking looking at stuff and visual elements. What do you what do you guys say? Yeah. So, I mean, maybe to tie it into also your previous question about whether or not, you know, classical music or not just classical music, but music theory in general is needed. Usually the way I think of music theory is more like the tool that I can use when I'm composing rather than it being necessarily the entire foundation of the music that I'm writing. So to go to when I'm writing music for a game or for a still film, but more so games, usually when I'm looking at a game, I'll think about gameplay first, actually, before I think about visuals. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. I play a lot of games, so I think a lot about, you know, if it's an action game, what's the pace of the action? You know, it's, is it Doom or is it Halo, right? These different kinds of feels to the game. And then after that, when I look at the visuals, I start to think about what kinds of genres of music have I looked into and explored and what kinds of tools, like I said, you know, should I use some of that classical music theory to write some orchestral music? Or maybe it's orchestral music that's more like Dead Space, where it's like all these crazy sound effects, right? And things that, you know, people are still trying to figure out how they even write it on the page, right? <laughs> um, so in terms of like looking at visuals and trying to figure out what kind of music, I mean, like I said, gameplay first, but usually I go more for what's the feel that I'm getting from the game and uh, what are the emotions or what are the story? first and then how is how are the visuals kind of first conveying those kinds of stories and other things then how can i augment that you know the music are you that's awesome kevin are is are you capturing the screen uh are you able to no. see the screen with the cameras no although maybe if you could send it to me after i could pop it up and that sure. looks a little better so sure. mm -hmm. yeah so, like for example this, this so we're going to talk about this. So you asked about how I got into games, right? Yeah. So this is one of the first games that I worked on. Uh, this company, Rocket Science Games, they were uh, over in Berkeley. Um, and Mark, you know, you know, had the gig with his company and he put me in there as the composer. They were having catered lunches every single day. Catered lunches? Oh, no, it was unbelievable. They were, because of this merger of Silicon Valley and Hollywood, they were, money was pouring in there. In fact, and I only found this out many, many years later, Elon Musk was a programmer. That's how he started out, programmer in games. So he was down really? in the basement programming. I never met him. I don't have any relationship with him. But he worked on this game called Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, which if you go to the Museum of Art and Digital Entertainment in Oakland, um, you know, there's a signed copy there because, you know, th it was a special time in gaming. CD-ROM had just come out and suddenly it's like, oh my God, we could do so much with, with visuals. So, you know, as Kevin's talking about, about visuals and everything, I mean, this is some of the first scoring that I did in games where they had actual cut scenes, which then led mm. to gameplay. Mm. And to your point, yeah, you know, 
what did they want from this? They wanted like an epic soundtrack. They wanted it to, to look and sound like a movie, mm -hmm. right? So that's what I, you know, tried to do uh, with this. And this is also coming along at a time when much of it is in the box, meaning that I'm using samples, right? And virtual orchestral sounds, that, you know, from that time period, of course, right? Um, and um, at the same time, you know, having the opportunity to mix it in with live instruments at times and record everything. And then they're triggering, you know, those, those files. So, you know, these kind of images, it just depends on what you're working on. Uh, the other thing that I, that I brought up real quick, just as Kevin was talking and I was thinking about that is, um, you know, this is a more recent game that I, that I worked on. And again, I'm playing these, you know, silently, you can play them with sound or whatever you want you to can do. play them with sound as well. It's yeah. To you. But, you know, the sponge has a certain sound, you know, as yeah. audio director for Nickelodeon, I have to protect the sound of the sponge, yeah. right? I mean, that's my job, yeah. right? So it's kind of cool because I have a template to go with. Like, I know there's going to be a certain type of sound that goes with the sponge uh, and his friends. But at the same time, I can play around with it in different ways because, you know, um, in one level, they go to Plankton's lab and another, you know, so I can mix different things in. But again, this is, this is not going to be sad. Yeah. Right. Whereas, you know, Cadillacs and dinosaurs, which I showed you in those cutscenes, might be scary or spooky or try to give you a feeling of a cinematic experience because it's telling you a story. Um, whereas in this case, we're talking about SpongeBob running around on a bright background and all these, you know, crazy things are happening. So it's going to necessitate just by that thinking about, like Kev was talking, pace, instrumentation, you know, um, uh, is it happy? Is it sad? Major, minor, those kinds of things. And whether I know music theory or not, if I can sit down and make those things happen, then awesome. God, it's so interesting hearing you guys relate game audio design to movie scoring. Yeah. Because the way I came to an understanding of what a video game was when I was a little kid was, you know, I'd see movies, I'd see TV shows on the TV, and I viewed video games as like playable movies. So mm -hmm. as far as like the audio composition went, it really seems pretty obvious, like the relationship between both of them. 100%. And what you have to also understand and uh, is that if you look at, <laughs> Nate's gonna roll his eyes because I mean, I just spent a whole semester doing a class on the survey of music <laughs> for, for visual media. <laughs> and part of that is to track the fact that when you start out, if you start out from the 19, or beginning of the 20th century, essentially, right? Um, you know, film comes in and it's a lot like video games when they first come in 50 years later that they're silent, right? Mm -hmm. There is no sound to these. And then um, the entire 20s and 30s is all about finding out, whoa, uh, technological advances in film. How does music relate to that? I mean, you get some weird stuff, right? You get stuff where, you know, piano players play to visuals on the screen. And the first time that there's recorded music, people freak out. They're like, where's, where's the orchestra? They actually are looking behind the screen to see where the players are because that's never happened before, right? Mm -hmm. And that's also the story. So then you get into animation, right? I mean, Walt Disney, it's kind of unbelievable, right? I mean, not only did he win more Oscars and Academy Awards than anybody else, but the technology and composers like Carl Stalling and, um, Scott Bradley developed these incredible techniques for timing exactly to picture. And that animation, then you cut to games in the, that start in the, you know, really start in the forties, but the game industry really in the seventies, right? It's back to that really basic animation and technology building on itself and figuring out what it's going to be. So they are intimately tied together. I, in my mind now, and you guys, I would love to hear what you think about this. I, I, mostly see a future where films and games merge, right? It's sort of like one vision, different screens. Um, but, um, you know, when we look at AAA games, they really want it to be, like you're saying, sort of playable movies, right? Mm -hmm. And on the other side of that, you also have all these, you know, films that are, you know, trying and exploring different interactive, you know, formats and everything so you know that mixture between you know what's happening with vr and ar now 
and where's that line drawn between between film and games is that a, is it a game is it a film it's interactive what what do you guys think yeah i mean there's there's some games that are coming out these days where and also some films too that you would see on netflix where they're trying to like mm -hmm. netflix will have this thing where they're trying to blend oh you can make the decisions to change the story black mirror right? yeah and then yeah. you have uh other games where they people will describe them right more as interactive movies because that's like you know when you look at the heavy rain kinds of games or uh detroit become humans those kinds of games people see it like that's really like the very interactive movies but i just got done playing cyberpunk you know cyberpunk mm -hmm. 2077 mm -hmm. and i was playing that game i was like this really does feel like especially like kind of a milestone in that i do feel like this is like a movie like a first person movie where i'm actually immersed and playing it in the story um and so like you'll have those games right that are trying to mix them more like the netflix and the other stuff but then you have games that are the more mainstream which are the cyberpunks and the the rpgs where it's like they're getting closer and closer to being more and more cinematic and so when people said you know 20 years ago games are like interactive movies it's like well now definitely they're getting really close to interactive movies both in uh your ability to have control over the story and also the visuals too in terms of how realistic you're yeah. getting yeah, and through Atlas, I feel like I have this unique opportunity where I get to meet people from a really diverse uh, range of fields and career paths. And I love um, sort of like comparing and contrasting them. And I think you, you see this maybe in sports where there's things that differentiate the greatest athletes from the good athletes from the bad athletes, right? <laughs> yeah, and Curry is a great example. That was a crazy game. <laughs> Last night, that was insane. I'm curious if you guys could speak <laughs> to in-game audio composition. What do you guys think differentiates the greats from the not so great, from oh. the mediocre. Wow, that's a great question. Um, I, I think we should go around the, the horn okay. on this, but but I'll, I will start on this. So for me personally, um, when I see composers like uh, Austin Wintery, when I see composers like uh, Guy Whitmore, right, um, composers that understand the technical side of the medium and apply their composition. Uh, and their compositional mind and their compositional way of thinking. Someone like also like Rich Freeland, disaster piece, right? Who worked on uh, Mini Metro and and other games, where they're applying their understanding of music into a, a dynamic system, right? And understand the game and build music that goes hand in hand with that. To me, those are the rock stars of game composers, right? Mm -hmm. Not uh, because look in game in game composition and film composition doesn't matter. You can I can write a bunch of tracks and I can throw them over the fence and a director or a um a designer, you know, a, a game designer or can get them and then they can put them into their game and they can loop around and that's cool, right? But when you take that next level, right, where you start to design music that is hand in hand custom built um, and you think about that from the inception to the ending, those are the composers that I find most interesting in games. Mm -hmm. So what about you guys? Uh, I would say uh, piggybacking off of that. So it, it's that one where you've got that perfect melding between uh, what the music is functionally doing and how it's working with the game and supporting it. But also if it's doing something that is uh, unique and different that hasn't happened already in other games. So it's that perfect function and form coming together, but then it's also doing something that hasn't happened already. Mm -hmm. What about you, Kevin? Anything else to add? Mm -hmm. I'd say I'm kind of of two minds, I think, on the question. There's the part of me that's like the composer, the technical person who says, you know, when you see a really nice music system, it's like, oh, yeah, I like how interactive that is and how much, you know, the composer is able to you know, split up their music or divide it and make it so that it's interactive and that it's essentially scoring kind of in real time, right? Uh, but at the same time, I also, as like a consumer of games, I actually just like sometimes music that's just, it's able to just essentially score things like a movie, right? Where I almost don't even notice that it's nonlinear music. Um, and like to that point, like I was just watching some cutscenes from like the Star Wars Jedi Survivor, and it's like a lot of that music is, you know, based on John Williams' music and it's very kind of, straightforward at least for my mic and tell because like, i can't see the uh what's going on in the background but they'll have cutscenes, right and there'll be like some emotional thing that happens and it's like oh i feel the swell of the music and it's very it's a very linear moment right and so the consumer side of me also says that in terms of what i consider to be like great game music i'm usually just thinking 
what makes the greatest experience for just listening, right? Where I don't even notice what's going on in the background. It just sounds like it's just perfectly scoring. So you feel like it's kind of in a way similar to that whole thing. Like if you're in a, if you're watching a movie, if you're watching a film and you don't notice the music, it's doing its job, right? It's like mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. right is happening, you know, those moments where you're, where the music is too overbearing or, or you, or it's calling attention to itself, throws you out of the narrative, right? Is it, is it that kind of a thing? Kind of. Yeah. For, Surprisingly, as an audio slash music person, I a lot of music kind of I think goes through my head, and like, I don't notice it because you're so like yep. you're caught up in the gameplay, you're caught up in the, in or in the film that you're watching, yeah. right? But I mean that does speak to it to say that if you're not noticing it, if it's not sticking out, maybe that does imply that it is matching. You know? uh, well, that's important too because there's a huge distinction there, right? When we watch a film, when we watch you know Netflix or television, or when we watch YouTube. That's a passive experience, right? Um, when we're involved in games, we're active, right? We have to be doing things. Um, and I think that also changes your relationship to sound, right? Because sound becomes uh, not just, you know, a way to paint emotion in the background, but it also becomes information as well that aids you in understanding how to play the game and, and, and things like that. That's a great point. Because if I'm playing a first person shooter, someone had a game audio design the sound of the rifle, right? Oh yeah. And every single time I shoot the rifle, that's like a conscious decision that I'm making. And that is kind of like my behavior is what precurses the like playing of that audio. Yep. So yeah, that's a great point. Um, well, well, also, you know, you have to realize that, especially on when you talk about the AAA game titles, I mean, if in those games where there's, uh, we can we can continue using guns and rifles it's like when you're shooting a certain style of gun they're recording that specific gun you know and if it's a tank or a car in a racing game they're i mean they're going really deep in terms of sound design these days um a lot of sound designers like will roger and those 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 folks who are deeply involved with that are recording that exact car and that exact motor in 27 different ways and then making sure that it's implemented in the game so it feels completely natural right um so yeah and all that stuff has to happen in real time mm -hmm. right Whereas in a film, you can sit there and you can scroll back and forth and make it perfect and then know you're delivering it to somebody. Um, you have to do the same thing in a game, but you just never know when they're going to do it. Yeah. And in anticipation for our conversation today, I was thinking a lot about, you know, video games are a big part of my childhood. Um, but one in particular, which is called Destiny, which I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with. Oh, yeah. Man, I in, played... In, 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 in my new book, we have a whole uh, analysis of Destiny 2. Oh, wow. That's of, amazing. Of the score some of the score from Destiny 2. Yeah, I mean, I remember sixth grade, I got an Xbox for the first time and I was just watching literally like Spongebob, like I was watching Nickelodeon, right? Yeah. And I saw a Taco Bell commercial and they were like, win a free PS4 and play Destiny. And I just saw the people with like the sparrows and I was listening to the <laughs> audio and I was just like, like, um, I was just like hypnotized. I was like, man, I need this game. Like I need to do whatever to get this game. Yeah. One of my buddies got it for, my, for me for my birthday in my middle school. And I played that game since like, to now right like even destiny 2 now so yeah um looking back what did I, what did you think of the music for that amazing for especially when i was in middle school those first dlcs i think it was called like the taken king mm -hmm. um i think that one won a couple of awards i'm not sure but oh yeah i think destiny won a couple game well, awards yeah specifically we look at destiny 2 which is a really interesting soundtrack mm -hmm. so um part of a couple of cuts from that are with chronos quartet so the chronos string mm -hmm. quartet is probably one of the premiere the greatest use whatever you know uh language you want to use of the 20th century i mean they have recorded more contemporary music um and brought more composers out and and done so many interesting composition projects so check out the chronos quartet if you haven't they're on that soundtrack you know lost light and a couple of other cues that's mm. with the chronos quartet and then you have large orchestral scores as well michael salvatore and other composers who who, who worked on on that score so it's it's a it's a really interesting score and in yeah. the book we go in and we, we look specifically at some score pages and we analyze some of the music and how it works uh, inside of the game yeah that score was so amazing to me i mean i could hear lost light like in my head right now <laughs> um, i'm curious if there's any examples of what destiny is to me for you guys and also if you guys could speak to maybe why um that game and that score was so impactful for you guys hmm. i'll let you guys start well first of all i gotta say i can't believe that destiny is now considered 
a childhood game. <laughs> you old now, Kev. <laughs> You're not young anymore. Because I'm thinking like, you know, Destiny. Fuck you, right? <laughs> if I were to talk about childhood games, i talk about Halo, which has a game before that, right? You're... Uh, <laughs> but just segue into schools, I mean, Halo had a great score. Yep. Uh, Marty O'Donnell. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think one of the things that really stood out to me was just kind of the melding of the electric guitars that would play, you know, when you're going into battle versus the orchestral stuff and the more kind of percussive elements. Um, so I think that soundtrack, at least when I was younger, really stood out to me. Mm. Um, I forgot what the rest of the question was. but Oh, yeah. Just an example of like what game and score of that game was really impactful to you guys. Maybe like the... The sole one that maybe inspired you or you think about whenever you uh, game audio design? I'll, I'll, I'll confess, my, <laughs> my video game knowledge is I am not a gamer. Oh, wow. I know. I, I come <laughs> definitely much more from a film background. So when I'm yeah. looking at these things, my references are much more on the film world of it. Huh. Um, I'm curious how you think that changes your approach and if you've noticed the change in approach that you have versus other people that think about it from more of a video game background. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a qualitative difference between the kind of sounds that come from these two worlds because I know that a lot of people now are actively in their just spare time listening to game audio. I mean, that is a thing and it's a genre of music that a lot of people are very influenced by um, where those aren't the reference points that I'm mainly coming from. Mine are mainly coming from from TV, film, video, and then just, you know, music in general. Um, so I'm, I'm associating a lot of what I see and what I'm trying to compose to things that I've seen in from those mediums. So it's definitely coming from a slightly different place because my background is different. Interesting. What about you, Steven? Well, I mean, I'll go back further. I mean, for me, I clearly remember the first time I heard uh, Super Mario, mm -hmm. Koji oh. Kondo scored to yeah. that. And, you know, um, I wasn't playing the game. I think my friend's kid was playing the game and she was like nine or something like that. Um, and, you know, that constant evolution where it stops and starts again, stops and starts again mm -hmm. um, as you learn to play the game so that's definitely one of them i mean i i don't specifically have you know i have a, a compositional style but i don't specifically have a reference in mind unless uh, a producer or a director or somebody that i'm working with on a project is pushing me in that direction they're like oh this has to sound like this like we were talking about spongebob i have to protect the sponge i have to you know <laughs> it's going it's going to be tied into spongebob's world in some way that's called branding um but um other than that, I, I try not to put myself like in a box. So many of the students who come through here are like, they they could tell you every, you know, if you mention a game, they'll tell you all the music and every level and how it's used and how it's applied. And, and, and I, I'm like, that's awesome. Now I want you to forget all of that and just look at this game or look at this film, right? Because we do teach film scoring here as well. Um, look at it and what do you hear? Mm. Forget what you know. What do you hear? What's your style? What do you want to do with it? Because um, if you just try and put yourself in a box of recreating, and a lot, of, a lot of game designers and game producers will push music at you. You guys are going to find this when you get out and start working on projects. They'll be like, okay, they'll, you'll be like, well, what do you want? And they're like, or what are you thinking? You start to get into a creative conversation. And they're like, you know, it, back in the day, it used to be a little, little different. So, you know, if you were film scoring back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, the director didn't hear the score until they got to the scoring stage. They might have heard it on piano a little bit, but then they got there and they heard it. And sometimes they decided they hated it. And that's when they fired the composer and, <laughs> and, and put somebody else in there. Um, that doesn't happen so much in games now because producers can be like, oh, here's five different pieces of music I really like. And usually they're always references from other games. Like, oh, we're working on a game that's a side-scrolling jumping game. Oh, here's the score from Bit Trip Runner, or here's the score from another one that I really, really like. So we want it to be like this, but not like this enough that we get sued. <laughs> um, and also, you know, it gets into strange little weird conversations, but, but people will push these ideas at you. And really our job is to like, take in the important information from that like what is it that they really want from this and then 
try to apply our style and our way of composing mm -hmm. to it to make something like Nate was saying unique, original. That's something that 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 might be had someone hasn't done already, right? Mm -hmm. There's 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 more than enough ways to make a living writing music that people have already written. That's you know formulaic, but you know we also want to be creative artists too, right? You know, and, and and create stuff that we really you know are proud of and really really like. So that's always that's a challenge because it's so easy now to do mock-ups or for people to hear what mm -hmm. it's going to sound like before you get there and they say well make it sound like this you know this that that happened in the film industry with temp score uh editing and it happens a lot in, in games yeah and to round well. out our conversation about game audio yeah i want to learn more about the dynamic in the game audio field mm -hmm. um let's take christmas movies for an example I feel like there's... Wait, just because it's Christmas? <laughs> because it's Christmas too, but I think in creative fields and, and, and art mediums, there's sometimes this dynamic that arises where there becomes like a benchmark where everyone sort of like reveres this incredible work. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times um, current and future work sort of devolves into let's make something as great as X or as great as Y. And I bring up Christmas movies because, you know, when we think about the greatest Christmas movie, I mean, it's really only a debate between like Home Alone and Elf, right? <laughs> <laughs> At least from my perspective. I'm wondering if in- There's the others, but sure. <laughs> yeah, right? So I'm curious in the game National audio- National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. There you go. Yeah. Miracle on 34th Street. Now I'm going way back. There's that one. Yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna go with Elf. <laughs> I'm gonna go with Elf too. Yeah, go it's but... a wonderful <laughs> life. Yeah. It's a wonderful life. Yeah. If you guys haven't seen it, it's still a wonderful what? movie. Yeah. What? <laughs> those are probably usually the movies that my parents are watching. Exactly. Like, those are the TV. those are the ones your folks are going to say you should watch this. I'm playing games. <laughs> I haven't checked that one out. I'd like to I'll play the it. It's a Wonderful Life game. Mm. That'd be good. Oh God, it get dark. <laughs> Would it? Hey, no spoilers. <laughs> no, no spoilers. No spoilers. I don't care. Everything in the in the game audio field is yeah. there an example of maybe one score that was oh. just so great that people just sort of. <laughs> view that as the benchmark and it sort of influences how they work trying to reach that uh, i mean this is endless okay so yeah. in in commercial music fields that's how it works somebody makes a game you mentioned halo right halo comes out it's a huge hit right um everybody wants to make the next halo so then it's called shovelware. So then the next year or two is spent with companies just creating games to imitate that in order to get, in order to, you know, get people excited. So you talk about first person shooters, right? I mean, if you ever really looked at first person shooters, uh, like played a bunch of them, they're almost all identical, mm -hmm. except they're reskinned, right? They have mm -hmm. different animations you know so instead of a zombie it's a you know a, a military guy or whatever it is right a person so uh there's a lot of uh shovelware there's a lot of imitation um so when you talk about a game like halo comes uh, uh, comes out i mean that i think that score was super influential on folks um absolutely 100 percent um you know when you talk about nabuo omatsu and the final fantasy series i mean those are beloved. You guys can throw out some names too, but those those change the industry, and then everybody yeah. wants to sound like that. Yeah, I mean, just recently there was a lot of people talking about the Doom soundtrack, Doom twenty sixteen with Mickey. Mm -hmm. That was something that got me into like trying to look into sound design and other stuff because he has like this talk at GDC where he's talking about the process by which he made the music, and that was like all in the realms of synthesizers and technology and stuff like that, which I had never gone into. Yep. And so you know, I mean, I think that was probably very influential, especially because you if you just look up on YouTube, right, a lot of people will take the style the style of doom right and then they'll try to take other pieces of music and then convert it into that to try to make it sound like that and i think they even have like their own kind of casual uh casual label for that kind of music which is argent metal and or yeah. argent music. Mm -hmm. it's definitely a subgenre now yeah so something happened there definitely in, in more recent years yeah i'm sure mario may be up there as well oh 100 percent. Oh, i mean that's the thing yeah. like, so when i started working in games in the early 90s um you had what was called general MIDI, right? And that was based on a, a technology called FM synthesis, still around today, like mm -hmm. the Yamaha DX7. So Michael Jackson, if you like Michael mm -hmm. Jackson albums, you'll hear the, the DX7. Um, that was the sound everyone was trying to run away from, right? I mean, chip tunes, 8-bit, all this stuff. People love that sound now. And at, back in the day, we were like, God, we just want normal music. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, why are, you know? Um, so... 
you know, um, that also is part of it as well. Just sort of movements in, in, in sound and music that keep recurring again over and over again. Yeah, and moving on, I also wanted to cover your um, experience being the audio director at Nickelodeon Digital. Uh huh. Could you maybe walk me through the experience? Now, now Paramount Games. Oh, okay. Mm. Is it? Potentially, maybe to be something else soon. I mean, I keep reading articles that they're on the block to be sold. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, could you maybe walk us through your experience, how you got the role, what you learned, <laughs> uh, lessons you draw from it today? Sure. This is, a, this is a good story. So, I had been freelance as a freelance musician, engineer, uh, my entire career. And um, first, I lived in San Francisco, did a bunch of game stuff here, put out a bunch of albums. Um, and, uh, and then moved to Holland for four years. And then when I moved back to the New York city, I got this interview to go in to, um, what then was, uh, Nick.com and, and, uh, and MTV.com. And I'm thinking to myself when I'm going in, I'm like, this is, this is silly. I've never had a full-time job. You're affiliated? Like, yeah. Yeah. They're, they're all part of the same company oh, it's okay. all under the Viacom logo. Mm. Right. Um, but at that point it was, it was, um, you know, you had the television station, but you had Nick.com, MTV.com. They were, they were s together, but separate entities, which is, that's the way it works a lot with corporate. And they may be in the same company, but they act as individual units. And so I went in for this interview and I was thinking to myself, this is, this is, this is silly. It's like, I've never had a full-time job and a, here's a, like a corporate job. And I interviewed with a gentleman named Chris Romero, who um, turned out we had both been in San Francisco at the same time, and we became really, really good friends. He hired me to, um, to, to work there. And one of the first projects that I worked on, I swear to God, so I'm coming from record production and high-end stuff. And so the first project, they're like, well, we want to do this uh, online radio station. Because you got to, in the 2000s, remember, this is when television was going to, yeah, the internet was going to take over for, te for TV. <laughs> it did, but it took like 20 more years to do it. Um, so you had all these companies doing that. And then we were having streaming radio stations and all this stuff. And they're like, we want to do a kid's radio station that has to do with something with barnyard animals and music. And I was like, okay, cool. That's, that's awesome. So I went home and I got out my sample discs of like animal sounds and I put them in my computer and I wrote a bunch of tracks to it. And I played it for, for my wife, Keisha, who these guys know. And I was like, I was like, what do you think? She's like, this is really weird. I'm like, yeah, it's really weird. And I did like, there was one track where I built a drum kit out of animals. I could, I could play this for you. I could send, I love it, to, send yeah. it over to you. So I, I made a drum kit out of animals. So like the chickens were the hi-hat, like, <laughs> and, and then the, the snare drum was a frog. It's like, and, and I had something else. I think a cow was the kick drum. It's like, moo, moo. I played it for Keisha and she's like, this is really weird. And I'm like, yeah. And I have to go into a meeting the next day with the heads of the company and with Chris, my boss. So I go in and I'm sitting there and I, they're like, oh, so play us what you got. And so I put the tracks on and I start playing and I'm thinking, I'm fired. This is, good. <laughs> this is being good to be here. But, and without skipping a beat, I played so like three tracks for them. They looked at me and they're like, this is cool. Can you make more of this? And I literally did a double take, like, am I on candid camera? <laughs> it's like, what's going on? Because my experience in terms of in terms of music for visual media at that point was always like, you'd play it for a person and be like, that's good, but can you make it more green? Uh, could you or you know, can you like this is cool? I really like that sound of of violins, but you know, can you make it more like nine inch nails? And it's like, wait, we've been talking about this for like three months, and now you're telling me this crazy thing. It's like they have nothing to do with each other. That was my experience until I got into the game world, and people are just like, you're the you're the music audio person. This sounds great. Go do more. I was like, this is awesome. That's how I got started in doing music and sound for games. Mm. And, you know, my relationship with Nickelodeon, if you had told me I'd still be audio directing for them 23 years later, I'd be like, what have you been smoking? This is crazy. But literally now, if I wanted to put out a press release, I, I've done over a thousand games. Wow. Those aren't AAA titles. Those can be anything from like a, 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 a small Dora game. I was invited to Dora's Quinceañera. Do you guys know this? <laughs> yeah, I used to record the original Dora Kathleen in New York. Um, and, you know, she was awesome. And uh, we did a lot of sessions together. And she invited me to her, to her Quinceañera. 
I, uh, so no. anyway, I didn't go, but I just just to make a point that it's like I've worked on a lot of games over time, everything from console games to mobile games to AR and VR, and there's some really cool stuff going on right now. So, what do you think your experience at Nickelodeon taught you about the optimal work environment in mm. order to compose? Yeah, and fear. Audio. <laughs> fear. You have to you instill fear. No, I'm just totally joking. The best working environment is communication, right? It's like you can ask these guys. I mean, I think I try and I try and make my classes that I teach here um, as much like the real world as possible. You know, it's like I treat everybody like an adult, and we communicate, and we all try and do really good work, right? So I think more than anything, the part that gets missed in in for musicians who are going to work in teams with other people, right? Because games are a team sport. Films are more of a tennis match, <laughs> usually, <laughs> right? In terms of sport between director and composer. Um, but, you know, um, you want to just communicate as much as possible. Ask a ton of questions, like the people that you work with. That's the best. When you like the people that you work with, when you start working at a place, and you, you're just doing good work and it feels comfortable, that is the best, absolutely the best. And, and I'll let you guys answer too. Yeah, I mean, in terms of all the projects that I've done at SF State, one of the things that I think I've learned is that if, you're, if your team makes a Discord and the Discord is quiet for an entire week, that's not good. <laughs> that's not a good sign if people aren't talking. And not just like talking about like people giving, saying, do this, do that, do this, do that. But people also, it's like, they just had the SFSU game dev club. They just finished up wrapping up some of the games that they made. And when I'm sitting in those discords, it's like, look, I want the animation person to be talking to the sound person. I want the sound person to be talking to the programmer. You want all these people, they have all their different channels. That's like, I want you guys to be jumping between these channels, like seeing what's the conversation happening over here. What's that conversation happening over here? Because I find for a lot of people when they're first learning, they, they have this idea that you'll just tell me what to do, right? You'll just say, I want this or I want that. Give me that stuff. And then I'll just go make it and then I'll give it to you. Right, but I really find that at least working in a team environment is about that conversation. It's about creating something together because maybe when you go out and work at companies and stuff, they'll, they'll just give you exactly what they want and they'll tell you. But in this case, when you're learning, it's like, how do you be a team member, not just the audio person who's just outside, who's just waiting to get you know whatever work is given to them. Uh, so that's one of the things that I try to kind of push with everybody when I'm talking to them, and even when I'm leading, you know, teams and stuff. It's like I'll, I'll give you an idea. But I want this to be a conversation, even though you, I know that it's frustrating you that I'm not giving you exactly what I want, showing you make this thing and do this exact thing. Uh, I mean, because even though there's a lot of technical in it, right? This is a creative, it's a creative discipline, right? These are all creative fields. So, you know, as artists and as creative people, when someone gives you something, have ideas, experiment, try different things. Don't just look for the one thing that you think that they want unless your paycheck depends on it. <laughs> it's okay, yeah. but otherwise. And just to gang a little bit uh, you know, about what you're saying, I'm thinking about Lena Rain, who's like, I discovered her music this year and I think it's she's amazing. Um, you know, they found her on Discord or Twitter or did through her feed mm -hmm. and then just got in touch with her and like, your music is perfect for our game. This is what we want. And we all know how successful that game beca became. And that's, I think, part of what you're talking about is like, it's, it's always best when it's, you know, a team sport and people are communicating. What about what about you, Nate? Yeah, I mean, it's why I'm loving working with Kevin cuz <laughs> too much communication maybe. <laughs> it, you know, but it's it, it, I it, if I think of something weird that I want to try to do, I can throw it to Kevin. It's like, how are we going to make this work? How can it be done? Can it be done? Yeah. And if if he can come up with a way to make it work, we're going to do it. If not, I'll modify my hopes and dreams of, of what <laughs> I was going to try to do, and, and we'll do it a different way. Yeah. And being able to have that quick back and forth where, you know, you, you can't do it alone. Or you would have to have such a wide skill set to right. be able to do it alone that it, it's nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have to work with others. And yeah. just to speak to like what you're going through, it's like, we'll have conversations here. You'll have an audio idea or I'll have an audio idea, right? And then, but you don't really know like the programming side of things, right? Sure. Things necessarily get directly implemented in the game, right? But through having those conversations with other team members, you are now expanding like your knowledge base, right? The things that you know to have these conversations, right? It's like Nathan and I have known each other, what, for I think it's two years now. Yeah. So we've had a lot of talks, especially when we're just sitting in the studio. But you'll go out to a team and you'll be like, how do I talk to a programmer? 
How do I talk to an animator? How do I make their job a little bit easier by knowing part of their, what they have to do and making the assets in that way. And so again, going back to teamwork and emphasizing communication, I mean, that's what I think yeah. me and Nathan are also learning at the same time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and you're also seeing two sides of a coin here, which is really great, right? Is that, um, and tell me if I'm wrong, tell me if I'm categorizing this incorrectly, but Kev has delved a bit more into the technical side mm -hmm. of game engines and middleware you know, programs and all that kind of stuff. And I think Nate stays a little bit more out of that stuff and is more interested in the creative side, the compositional side. Not that you're not interested in the creative compositional side, but that's very common. And, and it gets back to what you were talking about. Like, do you need to know music theory? Do you need to... Not necessarily if you're working in good teams, right? Mm -hmm. People can work together and, and bring their skills together. Yeah, and I'm curious. This goes for all of you guys. Um, when looking back at your time, audio directing, is there a story or example of a big aha moment you had, and maybe what you learned through that experience? Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, definitely, um, like I was telling you when I first got the gig at, at Nickelodeon, that was a, an aha moment. Like, wow, this is a great team of people that are going to allow me to apply my creativity to, to what I'm doing. Um, I think also, you know, for me, it was my aha moment, you know, came very early on when I first started working in games with Mark uh, Miller and with Neuromantic Productions as we were going around is that, you know, I loved films and film music but I never thought I wanted to go to LA and kind of beat my head against being a film composer. Later on, I did. I did supersize me. These things just kind of happen, you know, they came my way and I end up doing that stuff and doing episodic television. Um, but, um, you know, games found me in a way. And the aha moment was that when I realized that, that I really liked this, I mean, going to these different companies and seeing all the cool work that was happening and all the, and it's also tied to technology. So for me, that was the aha moment where I'm like, I not only can make a living doing this, but I really like it. Like, you know, this is, I found my version of film scoring at that point, mm -hmm. right? That, that I didn't have to just make weird music and die poor. I can make weird music and then I could also do this other thing and maybe actually eat some food and have an apartment and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I love if you could maybe expand on your experience um, doing the original score for Super Size Me and maybe how that experience contrasted <laughs> with your previous work. Uh, yeah, did you guys have an answer to that last one before we jump into Super Size Me? Uh, like an aha moment? Yeah, an aha moment. Uh, I guess so. I mean, I kind of, I think my first came to us today was thinking about both film and video games, but as I learned, like you said, film is a bit more like a tennis match. So I think my aha moment was that idea that my I started working on game teams, I can do so much more than just write music or mm. things, sound effects. It's like, I've always kind of had this divide. And for me, like I, I'm a creative mind, but I also have the technical mind to do, you know, math, physics, other stuff like that, right? But game development actually allowed me to kind of mend those two, right? I can be creative, but you know, when that guy's talking about some program or something and I'm, and he's talking about the physics engine or stuff like that, it's like, oh, the physics engine. And then what if I make the music do this, right? So I can start to meld and I can understand the things that people are talking about. And then, you know, kind of put those two pieces together, which if you're just writing music for film, it's kind of like, okay, so that's mostly my creative brain, right? But it's like, I got this technical side that I want, I want to do more, right? I want yeah. to be able to be more involved. And so that was kind of my aha moment for games, which I think it's very scary for some people when they see how much technical there's like, oh, yeah. no, I want to stay on that creative side. But. Well, also, it, it forces you to make a choice. Like mm -hmm. I've, I've been in the game industry for a long time now, but I've never been a coder. I've had many opportunities where people have either said to me or on my brain, it's like, wow, if I learned some coding, I wouldn't have to... But I always wanted to be on the other side of it. You know, I, I, wanted, to only, I wanted to go so much as I can understand it and I can talk with programmers and we can, you know, make sure I was up on the technology, be a technological evangelist in a way. But, um, you know, it, it, that's what games do to you, right? Games force you to draw that line. How far do you want to go into the technical side? Because it is a deep, deep rabbit hole. And if you're the type of person who wants to, you know, who has, like Kevin says, more of a technical mind, you can just there's no end to cool mm -hmm. things that you can learn and delve into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything you wanted to add, Nathaniel? 
Uh, the only thing that I could think is what brought me into trying to get into this kind of composition. Uh, a friend of mine years ago asked me to do the sound for, uh, she was working at, was it Redbubble? And uh, they wanted a uh, uh, sound for a commercial. They, it was a commercial where uh, a couple is sitting on a couch and he is practicing the banjo. And it was a commercial <laughs> for pillows. She tapes the pillows to her head. <laughs> so they needed bad banjo playing. <laughs> I, I own a banjo, so I could <laughs> supply them with properly synced up bad banjo. And after doing that and earning dozens of dollars for doing it, I said, this is something that I would really love to try to do more of and pursue. Yeah. And it's just been sliding down that slope ever since. Mm. Well, thank you guys for those answers. Um, yeah. And, yeah, and I love if you could expand on, you know, your role in Super Size Me. And yeah. It was Academy nice. Award mm -hmm. nominated, right? It was Academy Award nominated, and we were robbed. It should have won. Robbed. Who won? Uh, Born into Brothels, which okay. which you have to uh, understand that the way the Academy works is that in documentary film and in short form and long form documentary, the, that's the only place that they can do humanitarian work, right? Because you know you never know what the films are going to be, you know, and it, it could be you know Road Warrior is going to win all the stuff, but in documentary, that's the place where you can pick a documentary that's about social justice or it's about um you know subjects that people aren't you know that are are meaning deep and meaningful and i think that the feeling that year was that Super Size me was already so successful and so popular it had already won and got its due and and crossed over into the popular culture so much that born into brothels was a film that they could bring out that people didn't know about about a very important uh subject matter so um yeah and 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 my involvement in supersize me is is actually you know that's also a, a, a good story i was you know my cousin dave um used to run the um uh, promotions for sony and one of the things that sony had was they were they had a truck and they would put playstations on it and they would go to beach volleyball tournaments and stuff like that around the country really? and morgan yeah so people would go on, this is when, you know, you know, they wanted to get people to buy PlayStations is back in the day. Um, Morgan was the barker on that truck. So his job was to like lather up the crowd and get them to, to go in and, and check out the amusements inside. Um, so when I moved to New York, Dave's like, you got to meet my, Morgan. You got to meet my friend Morgan. And at that point, Morgan was working on a script for a TV show. It was called I Bet You Will. And he had this idea, and again, you have to remember, this is New York City in the 2000s, so everybody is trying to make, uh, you know, content that's going to go on the web that will spin off to television. Nobody had done that yet. So Morgan got this idea for I Bet You Will, which was essentially how much you would humiliate yourself for money. And I, I met him and we worked on uh, about 40 episodes, which were through his company at the time. Um, that were meant to go online, that were distributed online. And, um, and then at a certain point, it was spun, bought by MTV, and they spun off to, to MTV, and then we did like another 50 episodes of that show, which was actually really cool because Morgan's concept for music on that was wall-to-wall, -wall, right? And he would just say like, okay, I'd be like, I'd be like what do you like? And he's like, I love blues. I love funk. I like, j and, and basically I had a studio in Midtown and I would just get m all my musician friends together. We'd set up Pro Tools. We would just do, we did all of this scoring live, right? No overdubs. Oh, and, and I would like literally the night before, I'd be like, okay, um, I need 10 short bebop tunes. You know, I'd be like, I'm just like, you know, okay, ripping off, you know, mm -hmm. all my things I can remember about my jazz playing, you know, and I'm a bass player. So, you know, all that stuff. And it's like, it's like, it's like, you know, all this conglomeration of, of, of short jazz heads and stuff like that. It's like, you know, green dolphin street mm -hmm. meets weirdness. And I just go in with a bunch of great New York musicians and we would just, we'd do that. And then we would do blues, we'd do funk. It was great because I was also working with my band on my own creative albums and then this was a way to get them paid because they weren't getting paid for that side of it nearly as much as they were getting paid for for going in and doing these sessions um we did hundreds of hours of 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 tunes this way 
And then they, we would just give them to the editors and they would edit them into the show. Um, so, you know, my job for however long that lasted, I can't even remember now, was like, I would ask myself, what is the sound of public humiliation? And then I would write that. So like, it was so, in some ways, really funny and also really based. So, so like there was, um, the one I, the couple that stick, couple of them that stick out. So the one of them. So you could play. Oh yeah, I can, I can play them for you. Oh yeah, I love to hear them. You want to play them now? Yeah, we can do that. Oh okay. Um, actually, I don't think I can. I can't. I have to send them to you. Okay. So you okay. put them in. So and then have us sit here like this. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> so we look like we're listening. Mm -hmm. Um, I will send them to you because those tracks I don't. Those, that's a whole different story. But those are publicly available. All right. Um. Unless we get the episodes up, which I might have a couple. I might have a couple of episodes on my on my uh, on my website. I'll I'll go look in a second. Mm -hmm. But but um, so one episode I remember really clearly was uh, they. It was like ninety degrees in New York City, and they thought, well, okay, how much would you? How much do we have to pay you to get a slice of pizza and put it in your pants, right front and back? And then run around the block and then come back and eat it. <laughs> so that was one of them. So I'm like, you know, I'm like, okay, what's the sound of that? And I, then I would go write that. There was this one uh, woman that they got to shave her head and they put it on a buttered hairball. And then she attempted to eat it. Didn't work so well. She vomited uh, profusely. And then there was like a dude, they gave a jar of mayonnaise. Can you eat a jar of mayonnaise? You know, and it would be like, well, what goes with that? It's like maybe, I don't know, you know, Mississippi Delta Blues. Okay, let's try that. Um, so anyway, that's how I met Morgan. And then he got the idea for Super Size Me. And at that point, I was also working as the in-house audio director at Nickelodeon, one of the premier kids channels, right? So um, I took on a, uh, every, I took on a nom de plume, which was my stripper name, you know, your mm -hmm. family pet plus your, um, plus your maiden name, so Fluffy Schwartz. And so the work I was doing for Morgan was all under Fluffy Schwartz I because I, you know, I didn't want to mix church and state because, mm -hmm. you know, you sign contracts at the time, you're not going to work with other people or whatever. Um, and so um, he started working on, on Super Size Me. Um, and, and then that was completely unexpected. I, I remember going to the... Um, to the rough cut, the first rough cut of Super Size Me, and looking at it, and I walked out of the building, and I already had the theme that I was going to write. I'll send it to you, that you can listen to it um, for the for the show, um, I, I for the film. I just heard it, started composing that, and then we we put that score together. And then Morgan was actually living in his um, in his office, sleeping in a hammock because he was like had no money, and then Super Size Me went out to Sundance. Boom, right? Got picked up by the Weinstein company and just boom, went. Yeah, and if you could give an overview that. of Super Size Me, like the content of the movie for those people in the audience that may be unfamiliar. Sure. <laughs> you really quickly. Uh, man eats McDonald's for 30 days. Man does not feel very well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. Every so, meal. What? McDonald's. Yeah, exclusively. Every meal, 30 days, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mm -hmm. And he, he had to eat only at McDonald's. Um, and uh, he started out uh healthy and you know he went to doctors and they did blood tests and all this stuff and uh and then by the time he got to the end he was not so healthy and his blood work was looking really weird <laughs> really weird and it, in fact it's really funny story actually i went to a rough cut screening because that's what you'll do when you're when you're working on these films after it had been picked up um so you go and 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 i i had to leave before it was done and i was like i was like did you die because literally there are scenes in the movie where he's at the doctor's, everyone's looking concerned. And I was like, uh, he's like, no, I'm, I'm still here, you know, but yeah. So that's the, that's the, uh, that's the story of Super Size Me. And actually it became a huge cultural phenomenon, right? Everybody was supersizing this and supersizing that. And, you know, that's uh, Morgan became famous from that. So I, it, it was nice to see that whole thing spin up from the ground up and, mm. and, and to be a part of it. Yeah, and I also know you uh, worked on a couple of MTV shows that you're speaking about. Yeah, so there was I Bet You Will, and then another fun MTV show was called Casino Cinema. Mm -hmm. So one of the producers who I had worked with um, 
on Super Size Me went off and was doing the show Casino Cinema and basically they show a movie and then in between they had a guy from The Sopranos and then Howard Stern's wife or used to be wife they would sit around and then they would just shoot the shit hmm. right and have a conversation in between about the movie you know and they were at a bar looked like a bar and they were like drinking and smoking cigars it was on Spike TV um, and uh, and yeah so I did some, I did the music for that as well yeah, and in working in like MTV shows and, and scoring movies, was there any like experiences with celebrities that you ran into? Let's see. I saw Morgan and uh, uh, Kirstie Alley completely polluted drunk dancing uh, during the Academy Awards. That was a good one. Um, the most meaningful moment for me, uh, because I'm not much of a star fucker, mm -hmm. you know. I do have my moments where I get where I get into into fanboy. Uh, moments uh, and that did happen at the Academy Awards so so um, if anybody who has a uh, a film at the Academy Awards that's up for any award that's nominated they invite all the composers to an event and, and this event uh, at that point happened at at uh, um, Zeppo Marx's old house from the Marx Brothers which was owned at the time by John Cass Cassavetes co hmm. composer um, and so I went there. I, I wasn't up for best score. The film was up, right? So I went to that, to that, uh, to that uh, event. And John Williams came in, and I'm like, "Oh, where's John Williams? There, that's that's cool. I like John Williams. You know, that's awesome." Uh, and uh, I think Alexander Desplat was there that year. A bunch of people. But then Andrew Lloyd Webber walked in, and I just Jesus Christ Superstar is one of my favorite musical scores ever. So I kind of lost my shit then i got i became a fanboy i went up and i'm like hello mr weber i really love your music and everything and i shook his hand and so that that was nice and, and that also was a, an interesting moment for me because it did make me realize that there was a reason i wasn't a film composer right because i didn't lose my shit when john williams came in i'm like i respect john williams like awesome right but i didn't lose my shit i lost my shit when <laughs> when uh, andrew lloyd weber came in the room why do you say that's the reason you you were a film composer uh, that that i wasn't Oh, the reason that I kind of knew that I, I, I like and I, I enjoy film music and I respect it and I love a lot of it um, mm -hmm. more and more over the years since then. Um, but there were reasons that I was working in games and doing other things and putting out my own albums and mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. And what do you think, um, looking back, led you to teaching? And Maybe I'd love to get also like Nate and Kevin's perspective being your students. Sure. And be honest. <laughs> as far as like maybe Steven's teaching philosophy things you guys love about his class. I need to think back. This was like a year or two ago. <laughs> I took classes, uh, at least from private lessons, from doing composition, private composition lessons. I remember for our lessons, we were very kind of freeform about it, right? It's like, mm -hmm. you didn't necessarily tell me do this or do that, but you kind of were more guiding me in different directions, which I think actually really works for me because I might do things that people tell me to do. Sometimes I go off on completely different tangents learning something else. Um, but I do like having that guidance and having that experience to say, hey, look into this or look into that or consider expanding, you know, how you're thinking about this in terms of a piece of music or things like that. Uh, and I find that I guess I appreciate that more as I've gotten older, too, because when I was younger, I'm sure I would have wanted more direction. But nowadays, it's like I do have that. And with the help of the teacher, right, have that kind of mindset of go out and explore and try different things. Mm. So, Anything come up for you, Nate? Yeah, I can piggyback on that one. There's, <laughs> there's definitely that. Um, Steve is, Steve is, Steve is consistent. Uh, having, he, he is, he is good at, at at guiding and pushing you towards coming up with your own solutions to the things. He is uh, not great at giving you the solution immediately to the thing, which is definitely a great teaching method where. You know, he, he's he's pushing us to to discover the solution on our own, come up with our own ways to do the answer, uh, which is you know always frustrating in the moment, but definitely the better way to learn something. Which is you know the good and the bad that I can thank you for because yeah. yes, it, it's it's always tough to have to find the solution, but it's it's the way to do it. Yeah, and I mean that is that is part of the way I teach. It's like I could. I could tell you how I do it, 
and I can tell you how other people do it. I can show you chord progressions and all that kind of stuff, but you're going to discover it and figure it out on your own. And that's going to create your own, your own style, you know? Um, but I think there were times when we had conversations about, well, what's the convention here? Oh yeah. What would you do here? And I'd be like, well, okay, here's, you know, here's, here's what you can do or what has been done. You know, um, for me, the teaching thing started when, um, I got interested in teaching in the mid 2000s because every time I would go and speak at the game developers conference or other conferences, people would come up and be like, how do I get into the game industry? And that's what started me working with the interactive audio special interest group. And we developed a whole curriculum for games. And that was me plus um, folks like David Havalosa and Michael Sweet, who David was working at Santa Monica College and Michael was at the Berkeley College of Music. And those guys knew a lot more about it than, than I did at the time in terms of education. And so they gave me an education on how to develop syllabuses and rubrics and all that stuff. So we put together um, a, a, a document, right, that, that became the template for the first book that Scott and I wrote together, um, Scott Looney, um, uh, which was called The Essential Guide to Game Audio. And then now the second book, which is a follow-up, which is, you know, essential uh, scoring and game scoring, you know, is concentrating specifically on music. The first book is everything having to do with sound. You guys have been through that class, the intro class, which is music and sound design and voiceover editing and just everything, any sound that would go into a game. Whereas this book now is mostly centered on, uh, all centered on music and 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 uh, scoring techniques and and things like that. So that that's where it started for me was from from that point of view. And then I just became more and more interested in in education and giving back and community. And you know, I I love working with these guys. I love working with these students and just seeing the light bulbs go on and seeing you know all the cool things that that you guys are doing that you know is unique and interesting and wonderful. So yeah, yeah. When thinking back to your experience teaching your past release book and your upcoming book. Mm -hmm. How would you describe your teaching philosophy and the way you approach educating your students? Yeah, so my, my I mean, my philosophy has to do with helping. Okay, I view, I don't, and, and I think one thing that we've done really, really well here is to not separate out disciplines. Like, I don't want people to be siloed. I don't want to be like, oh, there's a classical composer over here. There's someone who's only interested in musical theater over here. And then there's, you know, uh, game music and film music. And I want everybody to be together so that that conversation can happen. And it's not siloed, right? So that, you know, because um, almost guaranteed if I sit in front of a class of students and I'm like, okay, who would like to, you know, write a piece of concert music for uh, a string quartet? Everyone's like... I would. And, and then I'm like, well, who'd like to write music for a film? I would, you know. So I think that these delineations, you know, have broken down over the years and that, that composers are really interested these days in, and have so many different opportunities, right? Where they can, where you can write music. You can write it for the concert hall. You can write it for a game. You can write it for a film. Doesn't matter, right? Um, and so that's at the core of my teaching philosophy is not to silo people. Um, and we've done that here. Ben Sabi, who's the head of composition, he's amazing. And we've been able to really bring that so that everybody works together and, and informs each other. And then the other side of it for me personally is what these guys were talking about, is that, is that I, want, I want students to, uh, any composer, uh, student composers to find their own voice, right? It's like, why write the same music that's been written already? You know, there's already a Hans Zimmer right? There's already a John Williams. There's already, um, you know, um, a Guy Whitmore and an Austin Wintry. What's your style, right? Um, we need to know all about this stuff and know how it's built and we under need to understand harmony and theory and all those kinds of things. But what are you going to do with it that's your own thing? And it's like, I, I, I can't tell them that, you know? Uh, only, 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 the, only you guys can tell yourselves that and to come up with what your style, because I do believe that ultimately we're creative artists and that we need to create our own, our own style and, and do it in our own ways. Mm. 
hope yeah. that answers the question. Yeah, that's a great answer. And Nate, um, in your email reply to me, I saw you mentioned how uh, you look for films and other visual media and when you're scoring. I'm curious if you could speak to maybe what visual media and films, the role they play in um, your process of finding your own voice. Oh, well, I mean, I think, you know, at least for me, but I would assume for everybody, you're, you're influenced by everything that you take in. Mm -hmm. And I have, for a lot of my life, watched a lot of films and a lot of TV and a lot of all kinds of visual media, as well as listening to lots and lots of different types of music. So all of that comes in and whether consciously or not, when I'm looking at some visual that I'm trying to come up with some music for, it's going to filter back through. Mm. Um, so that's always there. And, you know, it, it's whether I would ever want it or not, it will be influencing what I'm going to be thinking because it's just embedded in me at this point. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thanks for that. And Kevin, I'm curious if maybe you could speak to how your mix of technical understanding, your interest in the technical aspects of games, as well as your interest in more of the creative aspect of composition, what role you think that sort of interplay plays in your uh, journey finding your own voice? Sure. I mean, uh, when you're combining like the technical setup of like music systems and then also your composition, I mean, those in and of themselves are two different systems and projects, right? Is that you have a piece of music, a piece of composition, right? That you know, people people don't like it when I compare them, but I talk about like the music system in a game or even the audio system in a game is actually a lot like a piece of music, yep. right? A lot of students they'll just look at me with like skeptical eyes, <laughs> yep. but when you look at it, it's like okay, so you can create something in a piece of music, right? And typically it'll be linear, right? But you can also create things in um, in the game world too that may be less linear, maybe more generative, right? And then that kind of starts to expand how you think about music in the sense that when I was learning a lot of classical music, right, it's like, okay, well, I was thinking linear, right? And then when you get to more contemporary pieces of music, people start talking about randomization, you know, they'll talk about John Cage's stuff with sounds and things like that. Uh, most of the stuff that can sometimes be very difficult, I think, for people who start out in the classical tradition to kind of accept. But then we start getting the games, it's like, oh, I am starting to think about randomization of even music, not just sounds, but also music, and also how you can have things be happening in the moment, right? I mean, obviously it's programmed to happen, but that generative idea or that idea that the music is evolving, it's not just written on a page, right? And then that's the thing that you play in an orchestra or whatever, but that can be attractive and all that stuff. Um, so in terms of melding the two or like just talking about, I like to think of them as systems, right? <laughs> and so yeah. anything that I take from the system of the technical side could also be applied to the musical side, even if the music is still just only linear. Yeah. And yeah. before I move on to the last topic that I want to cover, which was like sort of the current landscape of music and mm -hmm. scores, is there anything else you wanted to add to? Well, oh, I just wanted to say, I mean, philosophically, it's like it's it's like so many schools miss the the boat these days. Don't they they want to teach students to push buttons? Learn to push buttons. Okay, you want to use a DAW, a digital audio workstation. Learn to push these buttons. Oh, you want to do this? You know, learn to make music. It's the wrong way to go. It's like don't don't teach people how to push buttons the technical side is important but give the context and the creative side mm -hmm. and 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 you get just you get what these guys are doing which is great work that comes from all different aspects yeah great thank you guys and steven i heard you mention hans zimmer earlier yeah uh, i'm not 100 percent sure if i'm thinking hans zimmer correctly here but two examples come to mind mm -hmm. um of projects and film scoring that i'd love to get your perspective on I was watching a mix with the masters video mm -hmm. and it was Billie Eilish and Phineas. And they mm -hmm. were talking about their collaboration with, I think Hans Zimmer, or it might've been another composer, but it was for the film Tom Cruise. Um, and they added Billie Eilish vocals on top of like the score for the movie. Was that like a Top Gun? Was that Top Gun? Yeah, it was like one of the recent Tom Cruise movies. Not sure if it was Hans Zimmer, but- Mission Impossible, one of the two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, not sure if it was Hans Zimmer, but that was one example that came to mind and the other, was I'm not sure who the composer was for the Tenet movie, the second to last Christopher Nolan movie. Yeah. But um, Travis Scott's vocals were all around a lot of the composition of that movie. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if maybe you could speak to the collaboration of composers and scores with vocal artists mm -hmm. and sort of walk through that process. I'm curious if maybe you've had experience um, working with that dynamic and what your take would be. Um, well, it's interesting. So, I mean, if you go back 
So now you got to go back, <laughs> and I might be. I might be taking your question in the wrong way, but if you go back to the beginnings of film, you go back to the first Academy Awards, there was no cat there was no distinction between categories for score and song. Um, and then there became categories for score and for best song. And that has gone through a film for a very long time. I mean, for a while, songs were the thing. You think about uh, Midnight Cowboy, right? Um, <laughs> That film, so you had a song that was attached to the movie, and you know it was branded to the film. Um, I love Billie Eilish. I actually thought that what she did on Saturday Night Live recently was actually really super cool. She's a great singer, actually. Um, and those guys are also working in lots of different. They they break through boundaries. I really I really think it's cool. I don't know a lot about the two films that you're talking about mm -hmm. and the way they do that, but. Um, it's it is very it's there's two ways that this happens either they will be completely separate right so there's a song written and the composer has nothing to do with it or you get you know even going back into the day like someone like Dmitry Tiomkin who wrote you know High Noon who writes that score oh do not forsake me oh my darling and that becomes part of the film so it can it can work both ways um again I don't have a lot of information about those yeah. two films um and how that worked. I think the interplay I'm trying to get at is, and I heard you mention this earlier with SpongeBob, right? You were dealing with a brand and that informed yeah. the work you did, right? And one of the things that made me interested um, about Billie Eilish's work for the Tom Cruise movie mm -hmm. and Travis Scott's work for the Tenet movie was, um, I heard you talk earlier about the branding when it's like the actual work being made, mm -hmm. but were there ever experiences where the audio design also dealt with the branding of an artist who's just on the audio side, it isn't involved directly with the video. You know, maybe if there was like a game where you worked with a uh, artist who has their own brand and maybe if you could speak to their collaboration with them for the audio, you know, it's like the interplay between two brands that are sort of like collaborating indirectly. Yeah, I don't do a whole, and haven't done a whole lot of that kind of work where um, sometimes I'm asked to reorchestrate other people's work, you know, or a tune or a song, but I haven't done a lot of collaborative work, you know, with other artists or singer songwriters for for games or for films. Um, you know, you're make. I was thinking about. Um, hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's just not something that 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 I've done a lot of, so I'm not going to be able to pull something out personally. Yeah. Um, to give you an example, at least not at the moment. Um. Yeah. All good. Yeah. Um. I also want to touch on. I'm sure there's a lot of young people, um, listening to our conversation right now that are interested in entering the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. If you could kind of give like an overview of what you would tell a student. <laughs> about the entertainment business, how to navigate it, and what to expect. What would that sort of overview and explanation look like? Wow, um, it's the entertainment. It's music. You know, whatever whatever field of music you're looking to get into, whether you want to do games, whether you want to do film, whether you want to do concert music. Um, you know, um, it is all part of the entertainment business so you're going to have to do all the things that everybody has to do you're going to have to have your portfolio together you're going to have to have a great website you're going to have to um have your elevator pitch together you're going to go out there and you're going to talk to people and you're going to network like kev's out there doing game jams and 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 working with different teams are you still doing game jams uh no like i've never worked on like game jams but i think oh. it's going to be in the future i wasn't working yeah. on just my own projects just programming yeah. it myself yeah, I don't know why I thought you had. It's like I guess Sydney and a couple of the other students. Well, Alexa was and Alexa was really into game doing game jams, jams and here. stuff like that. I thought maybe you had worked on some of those, but um, there's all of that. So and then you just have to be patient, right? Do all the things that you know you need to do, and the advice that you'll see on the web, and teachers will tell you, and other people in the industry. All of that stuff. It's just assumed that you know your stuff's going to sound good going to present yourself well, all of that kind of stuff. And then be persistent and just be patient because mm. it, it, it takes time to network and to meet people. And you might get lucky, you know, lightning could strike and, and, and you'll end up working on some cool projects right at the beginning. Um, but also, I always encourage students to think entrepreneurially, think outside the box. You know, if everybody's trying to, you know, 
storm the castle and get the uh, Sony internship, you know, where they have one, you know, and hundreds and hundreds of people apply to it, you know, you can apply to that, but also think about all those other companies that are out there, music that you like, they may be doing something similar and contact people, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's hard, especially post pandemic. I mean, a lot of people have been stuck in their rooms by themselves for a long time. And it's hard to make those connections. It's hard to get out there, right? I mean, people are just starting to get back into, into doing those things. And, and if you've had like three years of, you know, only communicating with people by Discord mm -hmm. or, you know, Zoom, you got to get yourself out there. Um, go to things, go do game jams, go to um, the Game Developers Conference, go to the AES show, go to NAM. you know, just get out there, start meeting people and networking, be persistent um, and, and have fun, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it should be fun to make music and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, be creative. You yeah, know, and to and to find other people who enjoy doing that too, right? Yeah, and for the last question, uh, I wanted to ask. Well, I, I wonder. Oh yeah, is there anything? You know, you, these guys are are like I'm. I've done this. I've mm -hmm. had a career. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys are just getting started. I mean, what 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 advice would would you have, or how? What are some of the challenges that you guys are facing? You know, just getting into this now. Does that what I was saying? Does that ring true to you, or is it like, oh, you also have oh, yeah. to do these other things too now? Yeah. I think I definitely agree with a lot of things that you said. If I was to like give advice to people who are just starting out, first of all, there's just the advice of just learn as much as you can. Like, don't. I think a lot of people pigeonhole themselves, you know, especially in music too, where you have instrumentalists who say, "I only play this, I only do this," right? Um, so trying to expand your skills is something that I do a lot, and I think I haven't seen like the financial fruits of that labor yet, <laughs> <laughs> because like you said, you gotta be patient. Um, but I think it's still helpful to not only give other people make, make you look, you know, more, uh, more desirable as a worker for other people, but also so that you can have more confidence in yourself to be able to apply for things. So you're not just saying, I can't find anything that just exactly fits me, right? But you can say, well, maybe I could learn the things that they need for that job. Maybe I could learn this stuff. And I, you start to build up this idea that you can do these things, you can expand, and you don't necessarily have to find something that exactly matches you. Uh, in terms of like trying to find work, I still haven't been successful with that, but I would mm -hmm. say, one of the things that I've been trying to do is there's a lot of advice out there. There's a lot of things people say, they have good advice. Uh, and any, everybody probably has an opinion about how you can get a job and how you can get work, right? I found it's been helpful to take in the advice, take in what people say, and eventually when you have enough, just kind of leave it and stop listening for a while because, you know, people can say over and over again, oh, I should be doing this, I should be doing that. It's kind of like, I think there's a lot of things going on in the world right now, especially, you know, uh, things about, you know, labor right now and all sorts of other larger mm -hmm. topics that are happening that are outside of your control. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when you apply for something and then they reject you, it's like, it's not just because you might not necessarily fit or you, you don't have the skills, right? It could be like, there's all these other things that are happening that, you know, that's, that's why you kind of just gotta be patient. Right. And yeah. I mean, I, I, when I was starting out, I was, you know, recording my own with my band, you know, I know Nate's got his band and everything like that. And I was sending out, you know, to record labels, you know, or I was applying for things. I was collecting rejection letters. Like I was proud of them. I was putting them up on the wall. It's like I had a stack of yeah. rejection letters. It's like that was my, I that was my, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, uh, that's what, you know, it's like I did it my way. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. it's like you're, you're, the, I was proud of those rejections. Anything yeah. from your vantage point? Nate? Yeah, the one I would say is is uh, don't don't be quick to say no to anything. Try to say yes to everything that comes around. Let them say no to you, and be willing to take that rejection yeah. with with honor. You know, <laughs> let let them say no. You're not the right person for this, and then you just have to go. Yeah, okay, I'll try something <laughs> else, or I'll try again. Do you guys think the ability to persevere through rejection is something that people have started particularly struggling with in uh, younger generations because of the pandemic and everything kind of being Zoomified and having to just be in your room? Nope, I've never liked it. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say it's like a new thing. I mean, I think for every person, it's always a new thing for them to experience it. But I don't know, I don't know if like generationally it's like any different from those before. I mean, obviously nowadays we can apply for more because we have everything online, right? So you can get more rejections, mm -hmm. right? Uh, anytime my dad tells me stories about how he, people got work, you know, back in his day, it's like, oh, I knew this person and then they passed it off to this. Yeah. 
uh, I mean, hiring and going on applying is pretty different, I think, especially just between the generation of my dad to me, right? So in that case, yes, you can get more rejections, but I think the, the, the sentiment of getting rejected has probably been consistent, you know, over the years. It, it sucks, you know, but you wear it as a badge of honor mm -hmm. as if it's something that you really, really want to do and you keep, you just keep forging ahead, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the most inspirational quotes that that I've seen and that I like to play for my classes is the quote from, you guys have seen it from Quincy Jones, right? Mm -hmm. Where he talks about how not one ounce of his self-worth is tied up in what anybody thinks of him. And I think that's super cool and super powerful, mm -hmm. right? It just means that, you you know, it doesn't mean that you know everything. It just means that that you're willing to learn, right? And you're willing to grow, right? Um, and and find those things that, that naturally really, really work. Great, yeah, thank you guys. And for the last question, Steven, yep. uh, I ask this to every guest because I think it offers an opportunity for every guest to expand on trends or things they expect to sort of manifest in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah. And hopefully a young person listening gets pretty excited hearing your enthusiasm about something that they're gonna get to experience and sort of work with. Mm -hmm. And the question is, if you were 20 years old at this current moment, what fields would you study and what problems would you aim to solve? And maybe if you could speak to some trends um, in game audio design, audio composition, even anything that you think you really feel really excited for. And you ready? It's coming. You yeah. ready? You can know. AI. Do not be afraid of AI. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> you know, um, musicians, we're used to this, right? If we were sitting here in San Francisco in the 1950s, we'd be having a nice conversation. I'd be like, I got to go. I got to get over to the Claremont Hotel. I've got a gig at five o'clock. And then I have a recording session tomorrow morning with the SF Symphony, right? It's like, you'd be jumping around, um, doing a million different things because there were orchestras, radio orchestras and concert orchestras, and there were jazz, but everything was happening, right? What happened? Now it's like one dude, DJ, one person with a DAW, right? Computer can do all those things that it took hundreds of people to do before. So we are not, this is nothing new for us as musicians. We have seen technology change the landscape of how music is created and how it's made. One thing that has not changed is and I feel so positive about this, is that, and especially it was from teaching this class this semester too, that gave me more of this as I was doing more research for that class. Man, music is everywhere. The more we talk about how, oh, you know, musicians are out of work or AI is gonna change everything or composers are gonna be out of work, everywhere I look, people are either listening to it by themselves on their on their earbuds on the subway at their house or they're listening to it in visual media whether it's on a television show or on YouTube or like you know one of my students came in and he's creating you know music for anime artists you know uh, J-pop and all this stuff that if you asked me you know like if I was in Congress you know I'd say and I'm giving the State of the Union I'd say the state of the music is sound. Like we're going to be okay. AI is going to fuck shit up. It's going to be different. But those are the tools that we as creative musicians and composers need to look at now mm -hmm. so that we can use them to help us do things quicker, do more things more efficiently. All the things that we've talked about today, right? It's going to help us, right? Is it gonna put some people out of work? Heck yeah. It's and it, things are going to change and they're going to get different. But then again, the drum machine put a lot of drummers <laughs> out of work too. We still have drummers, right? Um, so um, uh, that's one thing, definitely AI. Um, and then, you know, peripherally to that, I think there's super exciting things that are happening in um, location based uh, AR and VR. Um, and I think those are expanding. As well as the third, the third thing that I think is going to be that is cool and also super interesting, and I don't know exactly how this is going to play out. I think if you'd asked me four or five years ago, I was like, I'd be more bullish on it. But um, things like Google Home, Amazon Alexa, those devices that you know, if you have them in your home, I do, and you're constantly like 
you know, play this song for me and it's hooked up to your Spotify or whatever it is. I think that um, voice activated assistance and how music is going to, to be delivered to people, I think that's actually going to be, I, I think it's on a downward slope right now because it's, they're trying to figure out how to monetize it, but I don't think it's going away. Um, so I think, and, and, and the thing that's cool about that is it's music, sound, audio, almost back to the days of radio, no visuals, right? So it's all sound. Everything has to happen through sound. Um, so I think those those three areas are very, very interesting to me. And there's there's probably 10 more that I, I could think of, but that's a... I'm curious to expand on the AI thing and ask Nate and Kevin. Yeah. It seems like when we think about career paths where the field hasn't been disrupted, that seems to be the career paths that are most challenging for young people to break into. Yep. And whenever we think about a disruption in a field, it seems like young people that want to get into that field should be most excited about that because yeah. it offers the opportunity for the young people who are most excited to learn new things and try new things yeah. and develop new understanding. It's, it almost gives them an advantage. From your guys' perspective, is that sort of your guys' sentiment about AI and how you guys think uh, integrating AI into your workflow in the next five, 10 years is going to look like? And hmm. I mean, I'm using currently a couple of programs that that function with some amount of ai where it can sense what's going on and it's going to spit out different ideas for what to do with it but i definitely think in the near future ai will be able to compose with a certain amount of prompting and it could be an interesting shift like you said for people coming up where instead of looking at composing from a traditional path where you learn music and try to compose you would be learning how to correctly prompt an AI to generate the composition that you're wanting, which is clearly a different field and a way to look at it. And yeah, I, <laughs> I, I don't know how scared to be of it because it will take away a lot of low level compositional work because there's so much media right now that just needs sound. It doesn't need it to be great sound. It just for all the YouTube out there, mm -hmm. it just needs something. Yeah. What about you, Kevin? Uh, in terms of my own workflow, I haven't used too many AI tools. I mean, not in the sense of like what they have with the like ChatGPT types of AIs, because I know like some of the Isotope products. Mm -hmm. They say they're AI, but it's more so comparing it to you know mixes and then trying right. to match curves. So it's not really like a how we like to think of thinking AIs or like things that can generate on the fly. Um, but I found that even working with those tools, I still need some level of understanding of what should be happening. So even if I slap on Isotope to the master, it's like I can go through presets, I can have them analyze it. But for me, I still have, don't necessarily have all the skills for mixing and mastering. And throwing the plugin on doesn't necessarily help me get it, I think, to where I like it to be. And so I still find that I need to study up on these topics and still have this knowledge. Um, so I can't, I can't really speak to like how it's going to affect like jobs and other stuff because even though I'm interested in having that process and having people who are knowledgeable about that, about that process, companies might not be. So, um, but in terms of like using AI in the future, I think it all just depends, well, first on the licensing, right? Because I'm pretty sure companies are very concerned about whether or not they actually own the music oh, yeah. when AI makes it. Mm -hmm. um, but two, also how the tools are put together and what they give me access to, right? One of the things that I've always thought about is, okay, I have a piece of AI that can write music for me, right? But if I'm working a game, Right, it writes a piece of music for me. Uh, that kick drum, I want that to be on beat two instead of beat one. Right, right now, I have to generate the entire piece of music again, listen to it to make sure there's no glitches, mm -hmm. and then you know they they're starting to have you know I think piecemeal things where they can break it up in different instruments. Um, but that's something in my dog just doing like two seconds. I yeah. just want the dog just move it and then it's mm -hmm. reprinted. Right. Yeah. So it really depends, I think, on how the tools can make better workflow for people who are still knowledgeable about things because mm -hmm. I mean, you can throw stuff into it and get stuff out, right? But if, for people who want to be precise or for people who want to make changes and be able to work with whatever they have with that audio, um, I mean, you have a lot more control when you make it yourself, mm -hmm. right? And so obviously, like I said, I don't know if companies will value that, but me as a composer and as somebody who's working, it's like when you're working with plugins or even sound, like people want yeah. more control when they're working. and Maybe yeah, I will get there. Maybe a bunch of lawsuits are going to happen, or I don't know. Who knows what's going to happen in yep, all that yep. landscape, right? So it's great yep. that they have the tools and that they're developing them. 
I don't know if for me if it's going to take over a lot of what I'm already doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Stephen, have you thought about how you anticipate you know AI impacting yeah. your workflow? Yeah. Let me let me let me leave you with two things. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about that. I'll get teacherly with you. Yeah. One is just to 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 piggyback on on Nate that I just see music in general. It's it's like a balloon. It's like AI may push on this side of it. And then suddenly everyone's going to be going out and seeing live music again, right? It's like, who'd have thought it's like, it used to be like you record an album. Records came back. Right. And rec right. It's like now you have to tour because you're not making any money off of selling music, right? So mm -hmm. it's like a balloon. You're going to push one side of it. And that's why I said I'm so positive, right? It's like music is not going away. How we point. consume it, how we how it happens, it's all going to change. But we're going to push on one side with this. AI is going to do what it's going to do. And like, may, like Nate was saying, maybe some low level. Yeah. But then again, look, you know, if I can have an AI that can write a piece of music that's exactly perfect to, you know, uh, Baroque counterpoint with or Bach. I mean, do I need to write that again, or do I should I be working on something else? But I'll leave you with sort of an educational way to think about this, which is one of and and I bring this up in my classes. So one of my favorite short stories is by Isaac Asimov, a uh, science fiction writer, and he wrote this story. I think it was in the fifties, and it was called The Profession. And in this story, um, it, it's science fiction so it always is a thing there's a bunch of young people and when they get to a certain age they all go into this machine and it hooks it up to their brain and then that machine tells them what they're going to do it's like oh you're going to be an engineer you're going to go work on the mars colony you're going to go you're going to you're going to be you know uh, a dentist or whatever it is and there's this one student that goes in there and they put the thing on and they're like oh, oh yeah. and they're like, well, we have to send you to the Institute. And his family is crushed, right? Everybody's like, we're so sorry, right? It's like, it's like, because they think he's, you know, has no profession. They think that he's, you know, handicapped, that this is terrible. This is the worst thing that can happen. His parents are shamed. And um, so he goes to the Institute. And they send him to this place, and it turns out that the Institute is the place where they send people who can still think. Everybody else is just doing what they've been given, and the Institute is the place where all the people who are left who actually can think and create and make all the stuff for everybody else to use. Mm -hmm. And that's probably at the heart of my educational philosophy with this, a lot of the stuff that we've been talking that's about. That's beautiful. Right, I, yeah. I love that story. You can check it out. It's compl it's online. It's called the Profession. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a it's 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 a it's a wonderful parable too. I'm not I sure think. if you guys have a use ChatGPT as like a learning assistant, but one thing that I found is man, it's accelerated the rate in which I learn. You know, my major is finance, so it's accelerated mm -hmm. the rate in which I learn things like tenfold. And it makes me think related to your story. It's like when we think about the impact AI is going to have on education, it almost seems like it'll accelerate the rate in which everyone can learn different fields. And then the value in lies and like the people that can participate in divergent thinking and really yep. think, because it'll empower them to be much more effective in all these fields instead of before having to outsource this to people who were sort of specialized. Yeah. I mean, that's the Frank Zappa quote, right? I mean, yeah. uh, without deviation, progress is not possible. Mm -hmm. Have you... Sorry. Well, also to speak oh, we're to gonna that, take that whole thing about people learning through ChatGPT, it's like... Mm -hmm. I started learning the music production stuff kind of on the edge before they came out with all the, the AI stuff <laughs> happening. And those resources already exist all over YouTube and other yep. places. So, I mean, is it, I, in my opinion, it's just another resource that people can use to like accelerate their education. But that, that kind of movement with people being, a lot, being able to learn things on YouTube and learn things different places online with tutorials and things, that has already existed. And now it's mm -hmm. just another tool that can maybe make it go faster. So, yep. Yeah. Agreed. Is there anything else you guys like to add? I think this is great. I, I'm so glad we did this. This mm -hmm. has been a, for me, this has been a fantastic conversation. I'm Likewise. really, thank you.